So my name is Marty Salma. I'm the Peace Liaison for U.S. Friends of the Soviet People. U.S. Friends of the Soviet People is a sponsor of this panel discussion this afternoon on the continuing Cold War, U.S. versus the USSR, U.S. versus the Russian Federation. Uh, in the left form arrangement, uh, we've got some conflicts. There's another uh, panel at the same time discussing the new Cold War. Certainly there are some new aspects to it. We're raising the idea that may not be evident from the face of the facts themselves by any positivistic or phenomenological or empiricist uh, historical presentation. We, we need to de get deeper and see whether there is some continuity here, whether the causes may be the same. Uh, we have four speakers, all very distinguished. Dr. Grover Fur, prolific author uh, in the recent period. He's a professor of English literature. He's made himself into a historian of the Soviet period in the 1930s. In his bio that he presented for the 2019 Left Forum, he left out a couple, uh, several books uh, that I have read of his that you may find very interesting. One is Blood Lies. He critiques the propaganda of Timothy Snyder. Khrushchev Lies. He goes through Khrushchev's speech point by point and shows them all to be lies. And he uh, read the first of his three-volume series, uh, Trotsky's Amalgam. We also have Maria Zakharova, a Ukrainian activist seeking the investigation of the massacre at the Trade Union Hall in Odessa in 2014. Dr. Angelo D'Angelo, who has uh, a, uh, been a lifelong student and trade unionist activist and uh, involved in many organizations listed in his bio on the uh, Left Forum's website. And finally, Joe Lombardo, who is the co-coordinator of UNAC, will be here as the last speaker. So Dr. Fur, please. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. <clears throat> Greetings to all of you. Uh, the title of my presentation is The Most Important Historical Discovery of Our Era. I begin with a brief discussion of my new book, Stalin Waiting for the Truth. You all have a full flyer. Exposing the Falsehoods and Stephen Kotkin's Stalin Waiting for Hitler. 1929 to 1941. It is a detailed and carefully documented critique of Stephen Kotkin's book. This is the second volume of what Kotkin, a professor of history at Princeton University and a fellow at the Hoover Institution, intends to be a three-volume work and the definitive biography of Joseph Stalin. I proceed in that book as follows. I have selected 10 issues of the high politics of the Soviet history during the 1930s and thoroughly researched Kotkin's account of each of them. I have added another two chapters of various allegations of lesser importance where Kotkin alleges some kind of misdeed, criminal or moral, by Stalin. A chapter on strategies of misdirection in Kotkin's book is an attempt to analyze the different techniques of falsification that Kotkin employs, and also the errors of method and logic, perhaps intentional, perhaps due simply to carelessness or even to incompetence which Kotkin utilizes in order to create the wildly distorted portrait of Stalin and Soviet policies that he promotes in his dishonest book. I have also added two chapters on central problems concerning Kotkin's research, his lack of source criticism, and his use of bias by omission. My book deals with all the alleged crimes and atrocities that Kotkin charges Stalin with. It includes all the passages where Kotkin alleges any kind of reprehensible <coughs> behavior or even insensitivity <coughs> on Kotkin's part. Upon checking Kotkin's sources, we normally find either one, that his source does not support what Kotkin's text says or implies that it does, or two, that the source does reflect what Kotkin says in his text, but that that source itself is dishonest, and that A, it does not reflect what its own evidence states, or B, its source is yet another secondary source, which when it in turn is examined, does not support the fact claims given, or C, cites no evidence at all. My working hypothesis was as follows. I would find that many of Kotkin's anti-Stalin or anti-Soviet assertions or fact claims are false, not supported by the evidence Kotkin cites, or indeed by any evidence. My further hypothesis was that the secondary sources Kotkin cites in support of these statements would either not support Kotkin's fact claims or would themselves be fallacious, unsupported by the evidence, if any, that they cite. My research has fully corroborated both of these hypotheses. In fact, I discovered that my initial hypothesis was too cautious. I have found that not many, but that all of Kotkin's fact claims that have an anti-Stalin tendency are false. In my book, I present the results of that research. 
Therefore, ironically, Kotkin's book proves the opposite of what its author intended. It proves that Stalin committed no crimes during the 1930s. For if there were any evidence that Stalin did commit crimes during this period, surely Kotkin would have found that evidence and included it in his book. Until Nikita Khrushchev's infamous secret speech to the 20th Party Congress on February 25th, 1956, the Soviet Union was regarded by millions, if not by billions, of people all around the world as a country where socialism had been firmly established under the wise leadership of Joseph Stalin. The cult around Leon Trotsky, never large, was shrinking. As a direct result of the publication of Khrushchev's speech and the books and articles that soon flooded out of the Soviet Union, accusing Stalin of more and more crimes and atrocities, at least one half of all the communists in the non-communist countries quit their parties within a couple of years. The Trotskyist movement took on new life worldwide. Since Khrushchev and the publications he sponsored dovetailed with many of the accusations Trotsky had leveled against Stalin in the 1930s. Trotsky began to be appear like a prophet, as the title of Isaac Deutsch's terribly dishonest three-volume biography calls him. Under Khrushchev's successors, Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chernenko, lies about Stalin were sharply curtailed, though never denied, much less refuted. Therefore, they were in fact accepted, since the Soviets had all the evidence we now have, and much, much more. During these years, anti-communist researchers used the books and articles sponsored by Khrushchev as the basis of hundreds of books and articles attacking Stalin and the Soviet Union of Stalin's day. It was during this time that the equation, Stalin equals Hitler, and communism, communism equals Nazism, began to be vigorously promoted. In 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev, the last general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, initiated a campaign of lies and slander against Stalin and the Soviet leadership of Stalin's day that went beyond even the vicious campaign of Khrushchev's day. These lies about Soviet socialism provided much of the ideological justification for more and more market-based so-called reforms in the Soviet Union, which greased the skids for the overt return to exploitative capitalism. To the present day, the mainstream anti-communist version of the Stalin era continues to rely heavily on the phony studies during the Khrushchev and Gorbachev times. This is most easily seen in Kotkin's book. Kotkin also cites many Khrushchev and Gorbachev era secondary sources. This is where my critique of Kotkin's book is relevant. Kotkin has spent his entire academic life, ever since graduate school, specializing in Soviet history of the Stalin period and especially the 1930s. And yet, he has not been able to discover even one crime or atrocity that Stalin committed. Not even one. That means that the anti-Stalin paradigm around which the mainstream bourgeois history of the 20th century is built is entirely false. The significance of this fact cannot be overstated. And not because the anti-communist researchers have convinced themselves and other anti-communists that Stalin and the USSR of his time was bad, bad, bad. Of course, they are going to believe that. It's in their material and ideological interest to believe that only capitalism is good. No, it is of overwhelming significance because, with few exceptions, the left around the world, like here, for example, right, has been demoralized and misled by this flood of lies about Stalin and the Stalin period. How do we know that the Trotsky, Khrushchev, Cold War, Gorbachev, post-Soviet, and contemporary claims of crimes and atrocities by Stalin are false? Evidence. With the partial opening and publication of documents from former secret, formerly secret Soviet archives, we now have the primary source evidence, <coughs> A, to examine, critique, and refute the lies about Stalin and about the Stalin era, and B, to start the vital task, the long march, of uncovering the truth, what really happened during the Stalin period. The attacks on Stalin began with Khrushchev, but for many years, Khrushchev was a high-level party official under Stalin. Therefore, the process within the Communist Party and within the Soviet socialism that burst forth under Khrushchev had its roots long before, long before, during Stalin's or even during Lenin's time. There is a lot of resistance on the left to considering the implications of this obvious fact. What process produced Khrushchev? In 2011, in a review of my book, Khrushchev Live, one leftist colleague sharply attacked me, claiming that I, quote, suggest a 
trail of blame worthy of the most hard-bitten Cold War ideologues. I responded by quoting a passage from the conclusion of Khrushchev Live. Here's that passage. There are historical and ideological roots to Khrushchev's speech, and these must also be sought in Soviet history. Stalin tried hard to apply Lenin's analysis to the conditions he found in Russia and the world communist movement. Lenin, in turn, had tried to apply the insights of Marx and Engels. Lenin had tried to find answers to the critical problems of building socialism in Russia in the works of the founders of modern communism. Stalin, never claiming any innovations for himself, had tried to follow Lenin's guidelines as closely as he could. Meanwhile, Trotsky and Bukharin, as well as other oppositionists, found support for their proposed policies in Lenin's works too. And Khrushchev, like his epigones up to and including Gorbachev, cited Lenin's words to justify and give a Leninist or left cover to every policy he chose. Therefore, something in Lenin's works and in those of Lenin's great teachers Marx and Engels facilitated the errors that his honest successor Stalin honestly made and that his dishonest successor Khrushchev was able to use to cover up his own betrayal. In a private email to the same colleague, I wrote as follows. <clears throat> I think that Stalin, like Lenin, and like Marx and Engels, were the best. None were ever better. In my view, Stalin and those who were closely associated with him, plus tens or hundreds of thousands of Soviet communists, were faithful followers of Lenin. They did, in fact, implement, bring into being, what Lenin wanted, socialism. Socialism in one country, in fact. They did not fail to understand or distort and so forth Lenin's ideas. They fulfilled Lenin's ideas. Lenin, of course, was striving to embody and fulfill what Marx and Engels had concluded. And I believe he did understand Marx and Engels better than anyone before or since, and did in fact follow their teachings, teachings with intelligence and innovation. But you can't have it both ways. If Stalin at all faithfully followed Lenin, and Lenin at all, for Lenin wasn't alone either, did likewise with Marx and Engels, then it follows that there are some fundamental problems, flaws, if you will, in this whole line of thought, because it ended up right back with capitalism. To put it another way, if we or the communists of the future strive to do what Stalin, Lenin, Marx, and Engels advocated, then at best we are going to end up right back with capitalism too. But we will not have their excuse. They were the first, the pioneers. Pioneers always make mistakes. In fact, it is inevitable. Mistakes are a necessary part of any learning process. But making the same mistake again is not a necessary part of the process. To make the same mistake again is to squander the lessons both of success and of failure that our predecessors in the communist movement have to teach us. We have to learn from their mistakes as well as from their successes. Then we at best will make new mistakes, creative mistakes, mistakes on a higher level in a Hegelian or dialectical sense, along with new successes. But if we pretend that, quote, Marx and Engels had all the answers, or, quote, Lenin had all the answers. Many Maoists believe that Mao had all the answers. Many Trotskyists, of course, believe that Trotsky had all the answers. If we believe that, then we are guaranteed at best to fall far short of what they achieved. Marx said something about first as tragedy, then as false, as farce. The tragedy of the international communist movement of the 20th century was that ultimately it failed. Unless we figure out where they went wrong, all of these figures, then we are doomed to be the farce, and that would be a crime, our crime. So we have to look with a critical eye at all of our legacy. Marx's favorite saying was, de omnibus dubitandum, question everything. Marx would be the last person in the world to exclude himself from this question. Today, after eight more years of research, and having written nine more books on Soviet history of the Stalin period, I would put it this way. The concept of socialism has been and remains terribly under-theorized. When people talk and write about socialism, they seldom, if ever, define what they mean by it. This was true a century ago as well. It was true in the Second International, out of which the Bolshevik Party emerged as the left or revolutionary wing. There was no generally agreed upon definition of just what a socialist society would look like. Some socialists even thought that capitalism could gradually evolve into socialism as the working class got stronger and stronger, and more and more social welfare benefits were won through the parliamentary or democratic route. When the Bolsheviks seized power and had won the Civil War, they were faced with a problem they had never foreseen. 
Building socialism in a country with a small working class and a very large peasantry. Under Stalin's leadership, the party decided to do what the British, German, and American capitalists had done, but what the Russian capitalists had not done, to build an industrial infrastructure. Moreover, they decided to do this without foreign investment. They also decided to collectivize agriculture, only getting rid of the medieval organization of agriculture in the Russian countryside. Could they put an end to the constant devastating famines, four serious murderous famines during the 1920s alone, and reorganize agriculture along the lines of large industrial farms, making use of farm machinery as on certain large-scale American Midwestern farms? That is, the Bolsheviks decided to do what capitalism had done in the industrialized capitalist states and to go beyond it by collectivizing agriculture. The Bolsheviks went far towards revolutionizing social relations too. Workers had more rights on the job. Workers were, reported, were promoted to colleges, technical schools, and to government and party leadership positions. Women got closer to equality with men. Racism was outlawed and, in fact, did diminish greatly. Artists were encouraged, often through sharp criticism, or often through inducements to serve the working class or serve the people and to work out how to do that in their own artistic mediums. However, many aspects of capitalist society remained. This was in keeping with Marx's dictum in the Critique of the Gotha Program, 1875, where Marx wrote that the inequalities of what he called bourgeois right would continue to exist. Marx famously put off the abolition of bourgeois right to the communist future. And he wrote, in a higher phase of communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and with it also the antithesis between mental and physical labor had vanished, after labor has become not only a means of life, but itself life's prime want, after the productive forces have also increased with the all-around development of the individual, and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and society inscribed on its banners, from each according to its ability to each according to his need. In this passage, <coughs> Marx appears to suggest that the higher phase of communist society, he didn't use the term socialism, would somehow evolve of its own accord from the first phase. <coughs> But this had not happened in the change from feudalism to capitalism in Western Europe, which was accompanied by centuries of ferocious class struggle by the super-exploited peasants, urban workers, indigenous people of the foreign empire, emperors, and slaves. How then was Marx's first phase of communist society, what later socialists identified as socialism, going to somehow evolve into the higher phase? <laughs> Marx did not say. What actually happened in the Soviet Union was an evolution, but in the opposite direction. Back towards market relations and ultimately to the restoration of capitalism. This is the question, the problem, the conundrum that everyone who wants to put an end to capitalism should be asking, researching, and theorizing. We can't build a better future unless we learn from the lessons of the past. And we can't learn the lessons that the history of the Soviet Union during Stalin's time had to teach us if we do not know what really happened and what did not happen. As long as we continue to be blinded by the lies and fabrications about Stalin and the Stalin period, we are at a loss. We will be building our theories, our attempt to learn how to build communism on a foundation of falsehood. And that guarantees that we will fail. It is obvious that the anti-communists want us to fail. No wonder they keep lying about the Stalin period and about Stalin himself. The Trotsky cultists also want us to fail because success, learning the truth, dismantles the Trotsky cult. <laughs> I have written about this process of uncovering Trotsky's lies and conspiracies, a process that ironically was begun in 1980 when arch-Trotskyist historian Pierre Brouet discovered in the just-opened Harvard Trotsky archive the truth that the evidence that Trotsky had lied to the world, to the Dewey Commission, and to all of his followers. Therefore, discovering the truth about the Stalin period is potentially the most important and most liberating discovery in many decades. Potentially, if we take its implications seriously, go about discovering the truth about what really happened during the Stalin period, and draw revolutionary conclusions from it. If we learn both both what Lenin, Stalin, and the Bolsheviks did was correct, heroic, worthy of imitation, and what they did with that was incorrect, 
that despite their own efforts led back to capitalism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Furr. Before I introduce our new speaker, Maria Zakharova, I was, uh, have to say, I was remiss in the, in the introduction to uh, Dr. Furr. What? We also invited Stephen Cohen, a uh, renowned Russian authority, presumably. Uh, he's a uh, uh, professor at NYU and Princeton. Uh, he's traveled in the former Soviet Union and in the, uh, in the Russian Federation, although occasionally he's denied a visa. He's also a member of the elite Council on Foreign Relations. He's this bipartisan. These people determine who goes into the State Department, uh, whoever is the President of the United States. Stephen declined for one reason, and that is that he could not face Dr. Furr. Uh, I have the emails. Uh, he was an email correspondence with me. Uh, he also said, and I didn't mention to uh, Grover earlier this morning, that uh, in his emails he said, Grover is a, 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 a Stalin apologist, and uh, the issue about Stalin has nothing to do with the Cold War. Well, the roots of all the Cold War, uh, well, they all begin with the anti-Stalin propaganda, uh, he, if, of course. So he shows himself to really be quite incompetent in email. And that was Stephen Cohen, who might have been here today as a speaker, but he cannot contend with uh, Dr. Furr. One thing I need to say about Dr. Furr's works for you all they are stringently documented. All his points are verifiable on the, on the document record. You find very few historians, uh, professional historians in the West doing that kind of scholarship. Stephen Cohen is also an arc, well, he's uh, arguing the view that uh, the so-called new Cold War, without looking into whether there's any continuity, is a greater danger than the old Cold War. Uh, Stephen Cohen is one of the architects of the old Cold War. He's a Bukharanite, an anti-Stalinist, and again, his only reason for not being here today is that if he were to advance his views, it would be refuted point by point by Dr. Furr. Maria Zakharova, uh, I'd like to invite you to come up here to speak. Maria is an anthropologist. She's from the Ukraine. She's an activist seeking an investigation of that horrific violence at the trade union centers by bullies uh, uh, and the fascists that uh, the Kiev government had bust into uh, Odessa. People were peacefully petitioning. As I recall, maybe Maria will correct me, but some of the petitions were for independence within the Ukraine after the coup and others for independence from Ukraine. And the major issue was the language issue, for one, mm -hmm. for one. Yeah. Maria Zakharova. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, my report uh, is the part of my research work uh, as an anthropologist. I, I'm uh, researching the uh, events uh, that are um, continuing in, in our country. Uh, I'm one of those who were born, born and grew up uh, in Soviet Union. And I remember the period before the collapse of the Soviet Union and understand the meaning of the term Cold War very well. Uh, we know perfectly well uh, that it's a kind of competition, a chess game. Uh, this is competition between different worlds, uh, systems, ways of thinking and living. Uh, Some time ago, when the USSR collapsed in the uh, 1990s, uh, it was clear that it, that old Cold War, the collective West won, led by United States. And Russia, together with the independent states of the former republics, became a victim country, which had to accept the rules of the game of the winner of the capitalism and his image of economic, political, and social relations. Almost 30 years have passed since then, uh, and the situation in the world has changed significantly. Uh, now we see that the Third, wo Third World War is in full swing. What are the distinctive uh, features? This is a war of thoughts, opinions, beliefs, and values of the people. One of its most important components is the war of history, the war of memory. When uh, 
for the sake of this of that political position, the forces in power make a change in the traditional view of the historical process of the past. It is aimed in at, uh, increasing the predictability and the controllability of uh, society through the development of a common ident identity, a common system and rituals. Uh, I will show uh, with the example of my country, Ukraine, how uh, the war of meanings related on the celebration of Victory Day in the war of 1941-1945 uh, has been going on uh, for the last five years. Uh, my report is the example of how we, within five years uh, the silent minority suppressed and uh, oppressed by the power and pro-Western primarily pro-American forces could really win. The memory of Great Patriotic War uh, is the important the Second World War is important for the inhabitants of our country because we have a huge traumatic experience that has shaped us. For four tragic and heroic years, every family in our country lived in war. They all fought hard against fascist Germany. The country has lost 26 million of its, its citizens. After the war, there was a huge de devastation. The memory of this is important for every inhabitant of post-Soviet space. The trauma that uh, that war in 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 like inflated on every family is so great that it has been passed on through generations. The heroes of that war are still alive in our memory, and we call this war Great Patriotic War. And when people are told to give up this memory, it causes a protest. The significant, significant of this day for us can be compared with the Independence Day in the United States. Uh, imagine if uh, the authorities uh, suddenly change the meaning of this holiday, prescribe to mourn uh, and uh, regret, uh, regret if they had banned uh, the stars and stripes and gone, God bless America, uh, and uh, they introduced new symbols, changed the context and even the date. Uh, <coughs> if the uh, Committee of Five would be considered uh, traitors, and Thomas uh, Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin would be criminals. This is uh, happening now in our country. Uh, since the victory of Maidan in Ukraine, the official authorities, inspired and accompanied uh, by so-called newly created Institute of National Remembrance, have made in innovations regarding the celebration of Victory Day. This is what was legally imp imposed on, on the state level by the dec decree of uh, our president. The first is date. Uh, the date of great victory in our country is celebrated on May 9. In Europe, the victory day is May 8. Uh, this happened because of the difference of time zones. Uh, uh, the Surrender Act of Nazi Germany was signed on May 8, 1945, at 10.43 p.m. Central European time. But it is uh, May 9, 12.43 a.m. Moscow time. That's why uh, the dates are different in our country and in Europe. Our authorities, in accordance with the course Ukraine to uh, uh, Europe, introduced the official celebration of May 8, the first. The second is meaning. In our country, Victory Day has always been a, a major holiday of the year, along with the New Year. The authorities called to celebrate it in a European way, as the day of memory and grief. The third, symbolism. In the spring of 2015, a law of decommunization was passed, according to which all Soviet and communist symbols were banned. Fourth, uh, whom do uh, worship? Fighters of the nation nationalists of Ukrainian Patriotic Army who fought at the 
side of Nazi Germany against the Soviet army have been made war veterans. They wage war against USSR, against communists who occupied Ukraine. In the title of the new holiday, there is the word, uh, I mean, reconciliation with previously enemies. So, the essence of all these innovations is away from Russia. We will not celebrate it is in, uh, is, uh, celebrating in Russia. We are going to Europe and now we uh, grieve. Thus, in spring of 2014, two camps were formed in Ukraine, its pro-government and opposition. These two sides are called in our country pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian. I will use the example of my city, Odessa, because I was a witness and a participant of these events. After the events of May 2, 2014, uh, when uh, 48 persons were burned, uh, burned alive, the city froze in anticipation of provocations, and all were depressed and shocked. We have a walk of fame. It's a big memorial of a great patriotic war in Odessa. That day, there were very few people because people were afraid to take to the uh, to take to uh, to the streets, and pre-Ukrainian patriots threatened all yet uh, another reprisal. The day before, one of the leader of uh, one of the patriots patriots of the city burned the St. George ribbon right on the eternal flame. St. George ribbon is a symbol of this holiday, Victory Day, which we wear on this day. But she was burned on the uh, eternal flame. And the nationalists claim it that they, in this way they would burn everyone who wore uh, such a ribbon. In 2015-2016, uh, representatives of uh, pro-Ukrainian Euromaidan organizations uh, fought uh, with supporters of St. George Ribbon with force. At the official level, it was forbidden. Since 2015, when the law of the communization came into force, all the symbols of Great Patriotic War were banned. Arrest and detentions, uh, detentions is in connection with the wearing of certain symbols associated with the events of 1941-1945 uh, have been widespread. However, this, uh, this uh, punitive measures gave rise to a very strong opposition. Since 2015, the number of people who went out exactly on May 9, not May 8, has grown exponentially to many tens of thousands of people. By their presence on this day, people showed protest against what was happened in, in the country. All these years uh, of suppression and terror on May 9 was the uh, May 9 was the only one legal way to show uh, this agreement. And uh, as the part of this commemorative protest, a protest about economic, social and political life is being voiced. People claim the memory of the war, but they have other problems in mind. These uh, problems are uh, for other seats. Uh, memory of May 2. It, is, it was protest against economic decline. Conflict between regions, West and East, because uh, these regions uh, were differently involved in the events of the Second World War. Language conflict, uh, conflict uh, it was forced Ukrainization. And conflict between town and city. Uh, for many city dwellers, forced Ukrainization was perceived as village violence. Uh, how do people act? Uh, they resist. They resist by the weapon of uh, the weak. It's uh, scientist James Scott, maybe uh, uh, his book, Weapons of the Weak, uh, this means uh, symbolic actions that are done within the law, but at the same time contains a message that is understandable by one or one our own and the power. 
people people understand that they are weaker and they make public transcript what is officially allowed to do and what contain hidden transcript. In order to legally express themselves, people put on clothes of red color or the color of St. George ribbon, it's like this yellow and black, you know this ribbon. Uh, decorate their hairs uh, by, with elements of such colors. They come with portraits of their relatives who participated in war, bear their medals on which there is any elements of St. George ribbon, and, uh, ban, uh, and the ban does not apply to the order, orders. They definitely use Odessa flag, despite the nationalists who use the Ukrainian flag and absurdly speak Ukraine. Nationalists attack the processions of May 9, uh, insult and provoke people under the tacit approval of the police. So it uh, has been uh, like uh, this the last five years. Over these years, the number of people who came out on Victory Day was grown uh, tenfold. Uh, according to the police, in 2017, 30,000 people came out. In 2018, 50,000. By the evening on May 9, 2019, the all amount of flowers laid on the monument of an unknown sailor uh, was about uh, 1.7 and se 1 .7, uh, meters uh, in high and 20 meters in length. Uh, this year, the police did not announce the number of participants, uh, so the huge number of people cannot be seen. It was 2019, it was the first year when people walk proudly, uh, lifting uh, their heads. All previous years, resistance and op uh, opposition were written on their faces, and they all went like to a fight. Uh, this year, uh, we felt for the first time that we won, and it was our holiday, Victory Day, in all meanings. Thank you. Thank you, I have a lot of pictures, but oh, I cannot yeah. show. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Our next speaker is Dr. Angelo D'Angelo, who has uh, quite uh, an impressive history from his youth in uh, political activism. Uh, he was a member of the W. E. B. Du Bois clubs, uh, Students for Democratic Society, Young Worker Liberation League. Uh, he obtained a PhD in labor history. Uh, he was with the Trade Unionists uh, for Action and Democracy. He's on the Executive Committee of the New York State Association for American Soviet Friendship Society, which was part of the predecessor of U.S. Friends of the Soviet People, the National Council on Soviet American Friendship. He's been active locally. He lives on Staten Island. He was with the Staten Island Council for Peace and Justice an anti-nuclear uh, movement, too, on, on Staten Island, as I recall from. So I would like to introduce now our third speaker, Dr. Angelo D'Angelo. I just want to apologize. I have bronchitis. A couple of things before I start I want to mention. New Outlook Press has a couple of books which uh, we're pushing. One of them uh, has to do with a Canadian uh, historian who wrote a book uh, way back, his name is Douglas Tuttle, on the Ukraine. He wrote this way, way back. Maria, you should take a copy. Oh, of you. Really good. It's in English, <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. One of those. Okay, it's excellent. It's called Fraud, Famine, and Fascism. It was written about 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, and it shows how the Hearst Press, which is the United States press, basically, showed pictures of starvation, in Oklahoma during the Depression, and how they used those pictures to say that there was starvation in Ukraine. And the, the pictures were documented. Uh, so I think everyone here should really go away with one, one of these. The other thing is excellent. We find this is very important for young people because they don't know the Soviet experience. They were not born. Their school system doesn't teach it. And, um, just a little P.S. For 34 years, I was a member of the uh, Board of Education in New York City, 
and starting from the time of Bloomberg on, I was told, do not teach history, do not teach geography, do not teach citizenship, which is the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, do not teach any of that, what were you teaching? Or teach to the test. So they have a test uh, in math and in, and, in, um, and, and in language arts. And that's all, we, so every day we used to do tests. Every day old tests. So when kids weren't now, I had special ed kids. So if they got stuck in the middle of the Bronx, and we, I was teaching in Staten Island, these kids were lost. They couldn't even go up to a policeman and tell them where they lived because we were not told any of that. You wanted to say one thing? Well, I mean, but there was a uh, tremendous starvation and farming in Ukraine. Right? No, no, right. I know that. There was, right, there was, correct. But the uh, American know? newspapers attributed it to socialism. That's what they attributed it. That's why there was starvation. It was Just star like attributable to Stalin's orders. Uh, but it also, speak. right now in Venezuela, Venezuela, there's claims that people are starving. I don't know if you heard this. And what they're attributing it to is not the U.S. sanctions, but to Madero. Uh, sorry, but getting back to um, these two books that I wanted to mention, we have them here. This is on lies that we were brought up in the school system and in society on anti-Soviet myths. Now, the Cold War. One of the victims of the Cold War were uh, Morton Sobel and Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, which today you don't even hear about anymore. Uh, uh, the 19th of, uh, of June, we just celebrated, and uh, these two people were murdered. This is a put out in 1952 on the issue. It's called The Cold War Murder, The Frame Up Against Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. I want to push this because it's directly connected with the first Cold War, what it did. Now, I was a child of the Cold War. I grew up. I'm 72. I was born in 1947. The, ch the Cold War started in 1947 with Truman. That's when it started with Truman. So what happened was that um, I was uh, in school and I was brought up uh, with the Red Scare. I had to go under my desk. We had wooden desks at the time. I had to go under the desk every time there was... Uh, a, they still do. They still do, but the yes, desks are do. not wooden anymore. Now they're movable. I live so, in New Jersey, they do that. They do high pool shooters, they do, but they do all right. of them. So the point is, we never were told why we had to get under the desk. It's just that we were second, third grade. There was a, a, a school, the way the school did it. It wasn't until later on I found out it had to do with atomic weapons and all that. But it was so permissive that even uh, TV programs like Twilight Zone in the 1960s had time and time again episodes showing the atomic uh, bombs and, and the threat of a Cold War situation, the fear of communism, even in the, as Gramsci said, even in the uh, culture of society, this is what you had. So as a child of the Cold War, growing up in that affluence, um, I remember coming home from school one day, I was in my second grade, and um, I told my mom, my teacher wasn't in the classroom anymore. She said, what do you mean? I said, Mrs. Levine is gone. And I found out later on when I was student teaching that she had lost a job during the McCarthy period. And a lot of teachers did in New York City school system, which I didn't know. This was another victim of the Cold War. The Cuban Missile Crisis, 1961. I was about 13 when that happened. And in that Cuban Missile Crisis, it affected all of us that we never really got it out of our mind as growing up. There were bomb shelters. Everybody was talking about bomb shelters. All this was because of the Cold War atmosphere at the time. Now, I wanted to mention a couple of things about um, fake news. Many, many liberals don't like that word, fake news. It's been popularized by uh, the Trump administration. Fake news. Left-wing people have been talking about fake news way, way, way back. They didn't call it fake news, but they were alluding to the same type of thing, that the media was not telling us what was going on. They were creating their own uh, scenario of things. What I remember when I was young and got involved with the left, 
showing a, a man reading a newspaper and it's blocking out the sun and underneath the newspaper is shade and it shows, uh, it says corporate media. That's what we used to call it, corporate media. Today they call it uh, fake news and the liberals who knew all about the fake news and corporate media in my day and now are not talking about any of that. So it's all controlled by the money who has it now. This goes so back in our history, as I said, 47, I'm a child of the TV. You can put me in front of the TV at two years old, and I'd stay there for three hours, mesmerized by the black and white little box. That was my generation. To this day, I'm a, if I come home, the first thing I do is put the TV on. And a couple of TV programs give you the illusion that uh, the media in this country is really democratic and free. One of them is Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, if you've ever seen that. She's one of my favorite, the actress. In that it shows the little town with the little church and the woman who puts out the little newspaper. And that newspaper is supposed to be the truth. And it's a joke. There never was that myth. From the very beginning, they were controlled by those that, that had the money. Growing up in the re first Red Scare, in the first Cold War, the enemy was the Soviet Union, Russia. Many times they called it Russia, they didn't even call it the Soviet Union. And I remember in early 61 when the movie came out, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, which was a comedy with Alan Arkin. And in that movie, it shows that uh, if, at the end of the movie you see that the Russians are just like us, they're human beings. But before that movie came out, the idea was that the Russians were enemies, they were evil, Remember now, the media is very oriented to the mass, masses of people. Movies, TVs, radio programs. And at that time, it was James Bond. And one of the movies was From Russia With Love. And From Russia With Love, it shows this woman, Rosa Klebb, who supposedly works with the KGB. And she's the epitome, uh, uh, she's the antithesis of femininity. And she wears this uniform, and she clips her, her heels together, and out of the, 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 the where the toes are comes a... Uh, a knife, a dagger. And this is what they were feeding us, that the, the Russians are bad people. In 1976, I had the, the privilege, which the young people don't have today, to go visit the Soviet Union and to be there for a while. It was during the Brezhnev period, which they later called the period of gold, the golden age of Soviet, I've seen some historians call it, the golden age of Soviet socialism. And I could attest that that's exactly what it was. I wasn't around during the the, the period before or the period after, but I noticed I was walking the streets and uh, the CIA had full reign to do whatever they wanted, so I couldn't believe it. And that's why I believe the CIA is involved with all that's going on now, because they had full, full uh, free reign to do whatever they want. But English was the number one foreign language in 1976. And so when I went around, I spoke to people, you could stick out, as you Americans stick out like a sore thumb, because we used to wear, the guys used to wear cut off jeans. The Russians didn't wear cut off jeans on the subway. They had long pants, so the young people. The city. You yeah. the city. So it was very interesting. I was there uh, for three months in the summertime. My experience there, the people were very happy. I, when I was in Leningrad, what I noticed was a spirit of community that they had. They said, come back and visit us next year. Come back and visit Leningrad next year. See how much we've progressed. What kind of society has people that says that? I know maybe in my own personal life, but every year I speak to people, they say this year is worse than last year, and it's gonna be worse next year. This is what I get from Americans. They don't, they're not optimistic. Do you remember, remember the Maine? That's the slogan during the uh, war in Cuba at Havana Harbor. And we wind up finding out that the Remember the Main never happened. I don't know if you know that. That's the historical uh, this decision over the years. That it was basically a Hearst-dominated story. The other one was Gulf of Tonkin. That was during my lifetime, many people here. And then the most recent one was the weapons of mass destruction. Now, all of those were, were done with the connivance of the mass media were done with the connivance of the Central Intelligence Agency, how it works together. Stockwell and many other former agents of the CIA have come out and said 
that the CIA works hand-in-hand with the media. Go back to 1960, early 1962 or three. There was a magazine called Ramparts. I don't know if you ever remember that. It was a, sh- a, sh- a shiny, glossy covered magazine. Looked like New York uh, Time magazine, but it was very progressive. And at that time, they had an expose on the National Student Association, NSA, which is an association of college administrations and university administrations. And they, the CIA, went into the, that organization, went to World Youth Festivals. And in the World Youth Festivals, they were uh, documenting discord in the socialist countries, etc. That came out through ramp, uh, ramparts, and ex- that, that gave them their place on the map. Ever since then, then they went up, then they financially collapsed years later. But it shows how the CIA was uh, involved with every aspect of what's going on. This stuff about hacking with the Russians. The CIA does have the, uh, uh, the capacity technologically to copy that kind of thing and to make it look like it comes from other places. For us to laugh and say that's ridiculous, we're taking history and pushing it away. CIA has done that historically. So that's my text. As far as uh, getting involved in other countries, I don't have to tell the people in this left forum how much this, the United States has been involved with other countries uh, by overturning government. I don't have to even go into everybody here knows. And that's, that's it. I'll end it there. Thank you, Angela. Uh, our fourth speaker is here. Uh, His name is Joe Lombardo. He is the co-coordinator of the United National Anti-War Coalition. At a time when the major peace organizations in this country, peace coalitions, were defaulting on their mission to oppose war from this onset of the uh, first Obama administration, the United National Anti-War Coalition was still out on the streets (coughs) active. And uh, really, the sole force. Uh, Now we have many more are beginning to join in anti-war struggle thanks to the efforts of the United National Anti-War Coalition. Joe has recently traveled in both Venezuela and the Ukraine. Uh, He's been to Odessa. He can perhaps, uh, I don't know if you're including that in your remarks, and on a mission to Venezuela with the threat against Venezuelan sovereignty. Joe, would you come up here, please? I'll make brief remarks, and then maybe if there's a question and discussion period, more things will come out because I don't want to duplicate too much. But from an anti-war perspective, when there was the Soviet Union, and um, they could talk about the Cold War, there was a permanent enemy that was there. They could use the fact of that permanent enemy to build the military, to give money to the military, and so forth. With uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, it became a little bit more, more difficult. And so they've been kind of going around trying to figure out who can be this common enemy, this all-inclusive enemy, and it's been a little bit difficult for them. So in the beginning, they figured it out. It's Muslims, <coughs> and they're going to have a war on terror. And that's because they were going into countries that had oil, which they wanted because the capitalist system here wants to, needs to dominate the economies of all countries and the countries around the world, and oil is going to be a big part of that. So Saddam Hussein, who was the big friend of the United States during the point when they um, pushed for Iraq to invade Iran because they wanted to overthrow the uh, government of Iran, became the villain. Um, And they used weapons of mass destruction as the Gulf of Tonkin um, incident of of that particular time. When you're talking about the Gulf of Tonkin, you should look at what's going on with Iran, because it's almost a replication of that. There's this boat that they said that they they found a, a mine on and so forth. And even the people that were on that boat and the owners of that boat said, no, there was no mine put on the boat. There was a missile that came and attacked our boat. And then apparently there was a shoot down of this drone and uh, Iran has done a great job, of course you don't see it in the media here, of debunking that, that the drone was actually in their airspace. They actually took the radar traces that took place and showed exactly where it is 
um, and so forth. And the U.S. Had to, was about to attack Iran. They, had, they were in the air, and they called it back. And I think part of the reason was because the evidence was so overwhelming, if it's looked at, that they were in, in the thing. And when they're trying to say that Iran's the aggressor, Iran isn't over here, we were over there. And then all the allies of the United States said, well, there wasn't enough evidence and we don't want this, and they don't want to go to war with Iran. They're even um, balking at the idea of the increased sanctions and going back on the idea of the Iran deal. So that's very similar to the Gulf of Tongue King thing. But they've now had to move on a little bit from that. They do a lot of vilifications of specific leaders, but now there's Venezuela that has come up, and uh, Cuba, of course, and they're not Muslim countries, but prejudice still does play a very big role. Racism and prejudice and anti-Muslim sentiment in, in their building towards war. And I believe we are in a permanent war economy, and I believe that war is an absolute essential part of what capitalism is today during its period of decline. And I think this is part of the reason um, that they have to look for these enemies and have to create a new Cold War. If you think of it just on this, this level, much of the industry has moved overseas. U.S. industry has moved overseas. Part of the reason is for that is they need to make a profit. You know, if you've understood a little bit about the dynamics of capitalism, you know that the rate of profit has to continually grow. And there's a problem with that because we live in a finite world. It can only grow so far. And we're reaching those, those limits. So they are scraping in ways to keep their profit going. The gross domestic product now, about 40% of it has nothing to do with production of goods and services, which is what it's supposed to be, but has to do with these financial manipulation schemes that are happening on Wall Street and these bubbles that could burst at any time and collapse the whole whole economy, but they need to do that to keep on increasing the profits. Just think what would happen if the stock market, they always tell you if you invest in the stock market, it might go down temporarily, but over the long term, it's going to go up. Imagine if in, over the long term, it didn't go up. Who would invest in that stock uh, market? Who would go? So they're looking for ways, taking the oil from other people, taking a greater part of the market and resources from other countries direct attacks on workers in this country, tax on unions, tax on living wages and things like this are all very essential for them. And so we have the military in 172 countries around the world. We have about 20 times the number of foreign military bases as all other countries in the world combined because we got to have those markets. When a country like Venezuela, which has the greatest oil reserves in the world, says, we think those oil reserves should be used for the benefit of the poor people of, of Venezuela. The United States can't deal with that, so it has to, it has to um, have this military. Right now, 64 cents out of every discretionary tax dollar in the United States goes to the military. You can't do anything else when that's the truth. Uh, you can't uh, build the, the infrastructure. You can't cure the, the pipes that are poisoning people with the water because there's lead in them. You can't dig them up and put new pipes in there. You can't give wages higher to other people. You've got to get rid of Social Security. You've got to do these things. So there's attacks on the American people and there's attacks all over the world so they can grab as much of the wealth from every single country as they can to keep this thing growing. And it's a losing process in the long run. One other piece. Imagine this. We have a very high unemployment rate in this country. They lie to you about the unemployment rate, you know. It used to be that the unemployment rate was the people that were unemployed, and that was determined. Then they said, well, that's not right. When you're unemployed for a few weeks and you run out of benefits, then we'll call you long-term unemployed, and we'll take that out of the uh, unemployed statistics, and it'll look like we're going down, but it's not. And not only that, of the people they do say are jobs, these are jobs where they work two or three jobs at very low wages, and it's very, very uh, difficult. So the unemployment rate is very high. Imagine if those soldiers from the 72 countries and all the military bases were sent home. They wouldn't have jobs for them. Imagine if the military-industrial complex, seven of the major military production companies in the world are in the United States. Imagine 
if they stopped making the bombers, stop making the bombs. And bombs is great for capitalism, by the way. You make a bomb, you drop it, it's no longer there, now you've got to make another one. You know, it's a kind of, it replicates itself. Imagine if, if that wasn't the case. Imagine if they didn't have that, those industries. Where would those people get jobs? The unemployment rate would even go higher. We have 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's people in jail. Imagine if those people were out of jail. Where would they get jobs? Imagine the people that are paid to keep them in jail. Where would they get jobs? There's no work for people in this economy. War is an absolute necessity for keeping it, this economy growing. And they will always do it, and that's the new Cold War. So now we hear this tax on Russia. Russia is one of the big, big countries. Uh, Russia controls its own economy. It's not controlled by Wall Street. It's not a socialist country anymore. China, the largest country in the world, is out of Wall Street's hands. It's controlled by China. It's not controlled by Wall Street. They need those markets. They need those resources. They need to be able to compete. Look what they did with this Huawei phone thing that they're doing. It's because they have a better technology than we do, so we, they're, they're the only 5G technology in the world. They accomplished it. They have to, they have to uh, attack them, so they put these sanctions on them and so forth. So th these are the things that are happening, and this Russian gate is part of it. So what's happening is they have a selection. And they have Hillary Clinton. And if you think of Hillary Clinton in the last election, she ran against every single policy she ever supported. She said, yeah, she was for the war in Iran, now she's against it. Yeah, she was for every one of these um, trade pacts, including the TPP, now she's against it. Yeah, she poor, supported the crime bill that put mass incarceration and put millions of people, but now she, and, and she made this comment that blacks are uh, super predators, now she's against it. Every policy she ever proposed or did, she had to say she was against it to be elected, but they're not against it. These are the policies of the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. There was no place for anybody to go anywhere to go, and all they had were these two parties, and in this country, they don't allow third parties. You have minimal third parties, but just to get started, you need 50,000 signatures in the state of New York alone, let alone the 50, 49 other states, just to get on the ballot. How can you be a third party? So they have these two parties. They both have these terrible candidates, but one candidate, Trump, seemed to be, even though he's a billionaire himself, he supports these rich people and every one of his policies seem to put his thumb in the eye of the system and people love that because the wars abroad are happening but the wars at home, all the things we said, all the attacks they have to do to maintain capitalism are happening here and so, so they voted for him. They couldn't accept this. They couldn't say, well, okay, this was a terrible thing. Uh, people were voting this way, so they had to find another excuse. What was the excuse? Russia. This fit into their plan of surrounding Russia with, with military and NATO bases and trying to take Ukraine around because it has the largest border with Russia, so they could surround it some more. And, and their wars against Russia fit perfect, and that's the excuse of why he didn't. Uh, could you imagine this, that Russia interfered on Facebook and they hacked the DNC and proved and showed that DNC had to, the head of the DNC had to quit over this, that the DNC was conspiring with Hillary Clinton against Bernie Sanders. These are the reasons that they were elected because they, they did social media and they hacked the thing. Imagine that. So they tried to make that as the reason. The United States involves itself in the internal affairs and elections of every country in the world. This is a cover from Time magazine in the 1990s after the Soviet Union fell and Yeltsin came in. It says, Yanks to the Rescue, the secret story of how American advisors helped Yeltsin win. <laughs> okay, so it's okay for us to, be, to do that in Russia, but it's not okay for Russia to send tweets? I mean, what the hell? They're doing a, a coup in Venezuela. That's okay, but Russia sent uh, had a fake um, account on, on Facebook. And by the way, they're using all of that 
not to stop the right wing and not to stop these, to stop us. How many people here are on Facebook that have had their accounts sanctioned in some way? You can't friend anybody anymore. You can't do this. UNEC has had it a number of times. They attack the left. They don't attack them. This is the new Cold War. It's the same Cold War. Really what it is is a class war. And, and what we have to do is build an anti-war movement that understands there's wars at home and wars abroad. That's what UNAC is trying to do. And that's why, as was said, when Obama was elected and the other major anti-war coalition, who I won't mention, um, uh, decided they had to dissolve because Obama was going to end the wars, in fact, one of the leaders of that organization actually told me at the time they had inside information that Obama was going to have a new cabinet level position. It was going to be the cabinet for peace. And I said, I don't think so. And um, I was right. They were wrong. Um, and so that's what we need to do now. We need to come together. We need to unite because these policies more and more are going to attack countries across the world. They're going to attack us here. We have to, the Democratic Party is not going to save us. There's not even an anti-war wing anymore in the Democratic Party. There used to be. Now they're, they're to the right of the Republican Party. When, when they say they want to talk with the leader of North Korea, they say no. When they say they want to draw troops from Syria, they say no. When they want to talk to Russia, they say no. They are to the right of the Republican Party on the question of war. So the only way we're going to do it is build a movement of the people. And in the long run, it is to our benefit because it destroys the myths that some elected official is going to win this for us. It is all on us. And we have the power and we have the ability because their policies are against the interest of every single person in this country and around the world. And if we can mobilize that support, we could win it without even a bullet being fired, just by putting our hands in our pockets and refusing to cooperate with them, and their system will collapse from, from uh, underneath. And that's what we need to do. What? Yes, I'm done. Thank you. I heard there was some, actually I heard this lady here in the very attractive black and white zebra type dress saying something about the famine in the Soviet Union, right? Yeah, so, okay, there was a famine in the Soviet Union. Uh, the story, the falsehood that spread is that Stalin had something to do with the famine. I've written about this. There's been a lot of very good research to show that, that not only did, was the famine not caused by Soviet policies, forget about Stalin's policies, but the Soviet government did a lot to uh, not only do famine relief, but also to help the peasants uh, in the areas affected by the famine overcome the famine. But what happened in the post-World War II period is that uh, the Ukrainian nationalists who fought on the side of the Nazis invented uh, the story to justify their fighting on the side of the Nazis, invented the story of the Holodomor, of the, that the Soviets, meaning Stalin, deliberately, uh, either deliberately or through incompetence, caused the famine. Now that is not true. I can't summarize all the evidence here for you in 30 seconds, but I can point to um, two of the books that I've written which discuss this in detail. And we have excellent research uh, by scholars who spent their lives researching Soviet agriculture and so forth. But this is a complete falsehood. There was no such thing. Soviet caused or Stalin caused famine. There was a serious famine, but there had been four serious famines in the 1920s alone. There had been serious famines in Russia every three or four years for at least since the 8th century AD, for over 1100 years. And after collectivization, the famines in Russia ended. Okay. And just wanted to yes. put that out there. Questions now for any of the four speakers? Uh, so with the lady here. I am certain, uh, I believe that uh, another factor in difficulties of uh, Soviet economy, which were, uh, and secondary to that, in uh, difficulties in Eastern European economies, uh, were the significant one of significant factors was the boycotts and of the, the rest of the world, of the West against Soviet revolution and those four uh, armies who mm -hmm. 
uh, were trying to squash the revolution and all the boycotts and, uh, and uh, lack of uh, cooperative uh, even help. I mean, Russia had the right to change the regime, to get rid of the system and uh, started the first revolution uh, in 95 was so peaceful that the whole world would a uh, totally peaceful change of uh, the get rid of Tsar and Kerensky government. The whole world forever should take example from this first uh, Soviet revolution uh, and French revolution so bloody with yeah. and the Jacobin, so that's one. And then the world, instead of like, trying to uh, respect another country's internal politics, they responded with total aggression, military aggression. And that uh, was one of the powerful uh, factors in economical difficulties, among others, famines, etc. On another hand, with everything I know, and we all know, Stalin was a Caligula and a tyrant, and caused tremendous suffering, and how few uh, dozen a uh, million people exterminated, gulags and all, the uh, Lubyanka, Lubyanka prisons. This is not uh, a fake news or, or yes, conspiracy theories. This is it's completely false. Oh, no. Yes. And one more, just one example about famines. What about uh, the uh, historical data uh, do you know the name Wanda Wasilewska? Mm -hmm. She was a Polish noble woman who yeah. became the fervent communist, like several, many uh, yeah. communists and yeah. members of uh, Central Committee Party were, uh, came from nobility, Russian and several Polish to uh, Dzierżyński was a Polish nobleman from uh, Excuse me, can, can you tie it up? Oh, yes, okay, let me finish yes, about the famine. We need to give other people a chance to make Let me finish about the famine. Yeah, please do. So, uh, Wanda Wasilewska, the member of Central Committee of the Earliest Communists, uh, she was a colleague and probably lover of... Uh, uh, I mean, I don't understand. And I read her in Samizdats, in Russia and in Poland, so, unquestionable, uh, reliable sources, not a propaganda. Uh, if you can't tie it up, maybe this is something you want to have a discussion with Dr. She wrote letters and letters about, uh, and she was a Polish uh, mm -hmm. noble woman, communist, and she was like condemning, risking her life, actually, opposing Stalin and critiquing, criticizing Stalin in her 30s, 40s, for uh, starving Ukraine and causing uh, famine uh, in Ukraine and sending grain to Poland and uh, protecting Poland. Is that your point? And true. there are so many documents okay, of okay. the past. Yeah, to say please, 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 we need time for it. There, there, there were Stalin's orders. And don't have also to mismanagement yeah. too. No, I think that's maybe a discussion we have Dr. Fur It is, okay. It is. Okay. 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 We have another question I'm over here. I'm open for the truth if I, sure. if I no, miss it. Well, I've written some books about this. Sir, you have a question or a statement? Yeah. I know that the Cold War <clears throat> actually started in bombing of Hiroshima. I was, I was in Hiroshima in the museum, and there was document shows that, well, the Japan was already, you know, lost in the war, and they, mm -hmm. they you know, submitted, but they go ahead and said, use the, you know, bomb of, you know, in Hiroshima and Nakazaki, because at the end, they want to give warning to the Soviet Union that, you know, United States have an atomic bomb and the Soviet was a start coming from the top to the, to the Japan at that time. I understand that, that mm -hmm. they used that because of the Soviet Union with the system of, you know, socialism that mm -hmm. they are fighting. But what I do understand is after 1990, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and they declared themselves they are not socialist anymore, they are a capitalist country with a capitalist economy, why the United States try to include them in their capitalist system as the rest of the Europe and become a dominant part instead of creating this conflict with the Russia, which is not a you know, so socialist enemy anymore, according to them. 
Could I make a couple comments? Um, uh, did just, any one of our panelists want to address? Yeah, them? yeah. First of all, um, uh, on the Hiroshima thing, I, I think that's right. I don't think that was uh, the Hiroshima bombing was made to end World War II. I think it was to start the Cold War to show Russia what we have. And I think it's very fortunate that Russia got the bomb because the U.S. showed in Hiroshima that when it was the only country that had the bomb, it will use it. In a flash, it killed a quarter of a million people. When Russia got the bomb, it became a deterrent. I'm for getting rid of all nuclear weapons all throughout the world. But it became a deterrent, it was never used again. I think that's a, an important thing. And it was very clear that the Chinese were suing for peace in World War II before Hiroshima. And it was Japanese. 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 And the Japanese were, the, the so Americans first. were discussing whether they should drop the bomb over the water to do a demonstration or drop it over the land. And, and um, they decided to, to drop it on, on the cities. I think that's yeah, very indeed. important. Joseph now, Moore. one other thing about all of the stuff with Russia. It, it, it reminds me a lot of what they say with Venezuela. What's happening with Venezuela is they put sanctions on them, massive sanctions. When I was down there, I could see it. People were dying because they can't have medication. That's a war crime, the United States. The United States is putting sanctions on Venezuela. They admit that they do that. Um, but they didn't start with that. Where did it start? It, what do you mean it? The situation with Venezuela. I mean, Venezuela is a wealthy country with oil. In it. Yes, it is a wealthy country. And what happened is they nationalized their oil. And rather than having 3% of their profits go to the Venezuelans and 90-something go to other countries, they decided they wanted all to go to Venezuela and they started programs for the poor. And that's where it started, to use that money instead of for more profit for Wall Street so they could increase this you know, profit. So they do these sanctions and then they say, you see, socialism fails. But they did those sanctions against Russia too. And Russia, one of the most backward countries, a total peasant economy in 1917, grew to the second biggest economic power. There was something in that economic system that allowed for that to happen. And the first one to send a person up into space. Mm -hmm. Technology became very good. There was something in that economic system that allowed that to happen. Now, were there political problems? Yes, I believe there were political problems, and I probably would disagree with some other people on the panel of the nature of those political problems. But I believe that it showed that superiority of that political, of that economic system. And the famines that started in the very beginning when the revolution happened, you have to understand, they just were in world a devastating world war where a lot of that peasant population was in the military. They didn't plant crops for a while. And then right after the revolution, 19 imperialist armies attacked that country to try to overthrow that revolution. And they went through a difficult period. Their economy declined at first before it went up. And then it started going up at a rapid rate. So there's many, many lessons that could be learned. And if we just say, look at the famine, or look at this and look at that, we miss those problems. Can Just like we're trying to miss point. it in Venezuela by doing the same thing. Thank you, John. I understand that some of you and many others find it difficult to believe that what we have been taught about Stalin and the Stalin period of the Soviet Union is 100% false, but it is 100% false. Since the end of the Soviet Union, uh, a very large number of documents from Soviet archives have been made available, been published, and transcribed, and put in books and, uh, on the internet. Uh, we have a lot of evidence, and it is now, and this is what I've been doing for the last 17 or 18 years, is studying this material along with other evidence, and uh, examining one after another all of the allegations of crimes, atrocities, bad things, and so in fact, that's what my talk was about, very briefly that supposedly happened during the Stalin time. My talk was about this latest book by uh, uh, <coughs> Stephen Kotkin of, of Princeton and the Hoover Institution, who is the great expert on the Stalin period in the world. I checked all of his evidence. Of course, I've done a lot of this before. None of it's true. None of it's true. So the question is, well, the evidence isn't there that Stalin did any of this stuff. Now. 
But many people, and I said this in my talk, including probably most people who would regard themselves as being on the left, believe that these, this anti-Stalin paradigm, which is what I call it. So the question is, how did you come to believe it? It's very easy. There's been uh, 70 or 80 years of propaganda teaching us all of this stuff. And sure, it's, it may be, it's a big switch to think that all of that is wrong. I mean, we thought we knew about the Soviet Union during the Stalin period is wrong. In fact, sometimes I start off my talks by saying everything, you know, there's a song by Weird Al Yankovic who says, everything you know is wrong. Well, believe me, it's true. Everything you know about the Stalin period is wrong. You don't know it, okay? And that's what I have discovered by looking at the primary source evidence for the last 17 or 18 years. Now, it doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or not, because belief is irrelevant. Belief doesn't establish the truth. Only evidence is to, can establish the truth, okay? But that is what you know, I called my talk, the most important historical discovery of our era. That's what I meant, okay? We've all been, been uh, indoctrinated to believe in these horror stories about Soviet history during the Stalin time, and it's all false. Thank you, Mr. Burke. I'd like to answer that. Yes, Andrew. Uh, the king, yeah. There's a little known <laughs> book among the American people. There's a lot of them. It's called Mission to Moscow. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It is the diary of the American ambassador to the Soviet Union under Roosevelt. Joseph Davies. Yeah, what did I say? I don't think you mentioned the name. Just... Yeah, but Joseph Davies is his name. It was so popular that they, Warner Brothers made a movie called Mission to Moscow with all these top, it's in black and white, with all these top uh, uh, actors at the time. Very interesting. I show it to people in my family, people who are not communist. You show them that. And in that book, he goes into, he's... By the way, this is excellent. You may not like the author, but he was good in his early days. It's called Traders in American History by Earl Browder. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Showing how it's not far-fetched for people to lead a revolutionary movement and then become traitors later on. In our own history, Aaron Burr and all these other people he goes through. This is excellent for Americans, in my opinion. Uh, I've always classified many of the uh, left leaders in two the categories, when they uh, were positive to the working class and when they were negative. And I feel the same way, by the way, about Khrushchev. Mm -hmm. I think he was positive and negative at different points in his life. Mm -hmm. And Tito, which may sound strange to people, but Tito during the period against opposition to Nazi Germany was a very progressive partisan leader. Mm -hmm. So. I, the point I'm making, yeah, I completely forgot, I'm sorry. Well, I like to <laughs> Question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd just like to express my appreciation to the panel. Yeah, 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 thank you. And I, I, I really Three appreciate dollars. the information that you've given in relation to Stalin. I've done a lot of studies myself in regards to the Soviet Union, the history of Stalin, Trotsky, and the Russian revolutionaries, and I've had serious concerns. And in my investigation, I found that oh, yeah, a lot of your works have dispelled the myths of what is being perpetrated. And I believe that those myths are being perpetrated by Yankee propagandists in order to further and condemn the, the positive contributions of the Soviet Union in human history. And so I really feel that your work is so important and it has done a lot. And I will further it and I will defend what you say. I mean, the name Grover Fur sends trainers <laughs> through the Trotskys. <laughs> I'm telling you, the first thing they say, if, I, if I'm a critic, Grover Fur, yeah. you know, and it does. And, does. And, and the information you revealed is legitimate, it's true, and I really appreciate it. And I believe that Trotsky, as you point out, was a Nazi clapper. And the facts point to that. And I don't know what his objective was, why he moved in the direction he did, why he changed, but he was never, he was never a true revolutionary. 
Lemmy would always call him a pig and a traitor. He was always critical of him. And I don't know how he implicated himself later on. You know, after Trotsky was sick and he was shot and he was wounded, you know, in 1918. So uh, I, I don't know how he implicated himself. I appreciate your mind. Let me say one. I was reading a book a couple of months ago. A book of, uh, about a Soviet uh, film during the 1930s. And there was a little interview that Stalin gave. It's not in his collected works. It was an interview that he gave to some filmmakers, which was transcribed. One of the things he said was this. He said, of course, this is after this is after Trotsky and Spell and after the, the, the major trials and Bukhari and all the rest of it. He said, I would like, this is what Stalin said. He said, I would like, when these people are portrayed in, in film, I would like them to be portrayed and they're as all-rounded individuals with positive as well as negative aspects to them. He said, because uh, people are not all either all good or all bad. And he said, these were, these were people who were very able. Okay, they, in their time, they were certainly very able and very intelligent. Uh, and it's much better to portray them in an all-rounded way as to, than to portray them as simply devils or bad or, you know, just evil. That was not. And, uh, so I think that why you, I ultimately, Trotsky, yes, he did end up writing in the German, the Japanese, and doing lots of bad things. But Stalin specifically mentioned, you know, he was a man of, of great ability, and at a certain point in his political, his life, his political trajectory, he did positive things. So I think it's important to, you know, to look at the complexity, the, the dialectics, if you want. The positive as well as the negative, right. even in basically negative people. That's a wonderful quotation from Stalin. Another question, Steve. Yes, sir. A uh, question to Maria Zaharova. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, events in the, the massacre on Odessa, yep. was there an investigation? Must have been an investigation. No, no this is not uh, the, the uh, like they make it an investigation, but they are um, uh, uh, speak only with one uh, side of the conflict. Of course. And uh, only one side of the conflict is uh, still in prison uh, for five years, no, uh, uh, without any judgment, uh, without uh, co uh, trial. Uh, trial. Solution. Trial. Without trial, yeah. Solution. So they are under, under its investigation in. in, in in prison, mm -hmm. but they are not guilty, but they are under the investigation for five years. We've been calling for an international investigation yeah, yeah. because they, they have been helped. And the only people that were arrested after the Odessa massacre were, although they had videos of the people shooting the guns and throwing the Molotov cocktails, they were not arrested. They still walk the streets, still, you know, yeah. still wear their Nazi patches on their sides. The but were the people who were arrested were the survivors from that massacre. They were arrested. And the next day afterwards, when the people of Odessa came there and saw the burnt bodies and saw what had happened and saw that the only people that were arrested were the survivors, they marched to the prison and took them out of the prison and did not allow them to be arrested. Yet there's still, I think, three people of that milieu that they still, for some reason, are trying to prosecute. And there's a case going on about that. Today we have uh, 26 persons in prison uh, on uh, different uh, political uh, things uh, connected with Second Yes. Just uh, another illumination to your question is that um, it, it is recorded that 48 people died. Um, there are those who think it was many more than that. But when the death toll gets to 50, they have to have an international investigation. <laughs> I see. Yeah. They stopped at 48. It wasn't 116, as I read at one point. Well, there was 100 wounded, they say, and 48 that died. But that people we spoke to, she, uh, Pippo was with me in Odessa, um, people we spoke to, many of them said it was a, little, a lot more. Other questions, statements? Well, good. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I went to the World Cup, and so I had a visa to go back to Russia to the end of the year. So, and I had been in Moscow and St. Petersburg, 
and I'd come across from Helsinki, and then I was in uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Estonia. Mm -hmm. But um, I had gone to the World Cup, I had, and, and they told me I had a visa to the end of the year. So I flew to Warsaw and I went to Kaliningrad, which is this little piece, non-contiguous piece of Russia that gives them access to the Baltic. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my last, <laughs> almost my last day there, I said, you know, what's that thing over there? There's nothing to see. It's very small, Kaliningrad. And um, she said, oh, there's a shipbuilding museum. So how do I get there? Walk over and over the bridge. I've been like a week or 10 days. I've been there. And I walk on this bridge and take a look around, and there's the Baltic fleet. It's the Russian Baltic fleet. Mm -hmm. That's why they hold it. Sure. But that's why they want the, that part of Ukraine. That's access to what? The Caspian, right? No, the Black, the black Cities. That's what that's about. Yes, I mean, that's these exactly things have about. other. Are you talking about the Crimea? Yeah. Well, yeah. You're, you're looking so, at it backwards. That's why the U.S. wanted to deny that to them. That's why they wanted to get the Ukraine no, so that the their only warm water port would be denied to them. See, I mean, maybe I'm a dope that I'm the only one that didn't know this, but I don't think people realize when they it's look at you know, our interaction with the world. It's a competition thing. about who controls the waterways and that's a black, yeah, that's a black But that's thing. that's over there. They don't try to do that at Long Island. They don't come over here and try to say we're, we'll take Long Island or we're going to get and we have bases all over the world. They don't. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, you can't just look at this and say geopolitical terms abstractly. The people of Crimea have a history, World War II, of being staunchly anti-Nazi, the uh, vote there, which has been verified, some 96% across all uh, demographic groups voted. In Ukraine, I think it was split, actually. Crimea. Oh, Crimea. Crimea. Uh, the, uh, they recognized that that coup in Kiev was a neo-Nazi coup, the people in general, broadly. So you have a history, a human social history, independent of these geopolitical uh, categories in you know, analysis that really needs to be examined. Mm -hmm. Only 11% of the Ukrainian troops left in Crimea elected to remain with the Ukrainian army and not put on the Russian uh, uh, uniform. Now, among those 11%, there's certainly a good percentage who did so because they have family elsewhere in the Ukraine, you know. Yeah. Uh, and not necessarily for any uh, political reason. So it's a very small percentage of the army, that's how the popular vote can be also verified, who remained anti-Nazi, felt the commitment to put on the Russian uniform and defend Crimea, which had been a historic part of Russia, ceded and only administratively uh, by uh, at Khrushchev's uh, initiative as to be a part of, the, of Ukraine. It was one union at the time. It didn't really make any difference. So, you know, the deeper roots are with Russia, of course. Which is amazing, because it's like... Um, I have something yes, I, was, I wanted ahead. to mention. I didn't get a chance to mention my discussion. All the polls, polls that they have been taking in Russia and in former socialist countries, Romania, others... Yeah, Romania, most recently. Most recently. Every, the majority, the, all the propaganda by the capitalists against Stalin, against um, the guy in Romania, uh, Nikolai Ceausescu, oh, and whatever the person is, but all the propaganda, the current polls still show the majority, the majority, including the young people who were born after the counter-revolution yeah. in 91. And I call it the counter-revolution because that's what it was. It was a contra thing just like Nicaragua. And what happened is that all the polls show that over 60, 65% of the people said life was better for the average person when they had a socialist-oriented society. Not in Poland. Poland is the not. only one because... I was mostly in yeah, Poland. But Poland is different. The Catholic Church is so enmeshed into the structure of Poland that there was a struggle over abortion that was a struggle that the Catholic Church barely, barely won, uh, lost, barely lost. That's how strong Poland is different. Yeah, it really it is. Remember, in 53, all the, all the agriculture and all the socialist countries were collectivized. 
except in one country, and that was Poland. So you're right, Poland is different. But all the Ukraine, all the other countries, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, it's this, even Czechoslovakia, it's the same exact thing. So therefore, that's why I think, in my opinion, why we have another Cold War. They're very afraid of socialism coming back to those countries. I think that is the main thing, economics. All right, let me, let me make a comment. The gentleman who was here raised the question that uh, Joe responded to about uh, the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <laughs> in D.F. Fleming's uh, two-volume history of the Cold War, that theory comes through that that was the first salvo of the cold post-World War II Cold War that was directed not against Japan as such, but it also helped them to disorganize. Uh, those were industrial cities, helped them to disorganize. There was a strong socialist and communist movement in Japan, disorganized by this very traumatic uh, uh, event uh, and consequences, but mainly aimed politically against the Soviet Union. However, <coughs> if one wants to look to the roots of that country, and in Fleming himself, as uh, Grover may uh, recall, goes back to 1917. So as Joe Lombardo and others were saying, this Cold War is a continuous Cold War. It is international class struggle. And the objective of it against the capitalist government in Russia is to keep the possibility, uh, the likelihood of socialism reemerging in the Soviet Union as it occurred in this, as it was developed in the former Soviet Union, from reemerging in those states that comprise the former Soviet Union. It is aimed against the, the working classes in the former Soviet Union, and it is helping to keep those Russian oligarchs in power at the same time. 